I am building a juggling robot and my design needs fast, strong linear actuators with relatively long stroke length. Commercially available linear actuators are either too short, too slow, or too expensive. So I've made my own. I previously made a video on the linear actuators I was using back then, which were very strong, but they were quite slow, a little wobbly and kind of loud. However, if you're after a linear actuator that is very strong and you don't mind so much about speed, then I suggest checking out that video. Now, almost a year later, I've found a design that exactly meets my needs. It's super fast, quite stiff, fairly light, and has a pretty decent stroke length. In this video, I want to cover how this new design works, how it's made, how well it performs, as well as some possible issues that I can see with the design. Before we get into the specifics of this design, it's worth looking at what the requirements of the design are. For Jogglebot's linear actuators, they need to be fast, stiff, and precise, as well as having a fairly long stroke length, so the Jogglebot has a pretty big range of motion. It would also be kind of nice if these actuators were pretty easy to manufacture, as in they don't need that many parts and they're not that involved to put together. And it would also be preferable if they looked cool because cool looking things are cooler. I think it's worth making clear that this design did not come out of nowhere and it has been a work in progress for quite some time. The very first linear actuators that I had for Jogglebot were just made of syringes and were super slow, very clunky. They had a lot of force, but they weren't that great. The next design was the design that I showed before with the stepper motor and the ball screw, which was again, super strong, but not very fast and it had its problems. The third iteration is very similar to what I've finally landed on, but it had some pretty big issues with it. And that finally took me to the current design, which I think is pretty great. So you can see how this design works in detail. Let's have a look at the anatomy of the design. The sort of backbone of the design is this carbon fiber frame made up of three carbon fiber tubes that get pushed into the 3D printed parts on either end. To fix the carbon fiber tubes into the printed parts, I had this great idea of having like a little sort of flange mechanism where I could insert a bolt and then it would expand these fins and sort of grab the tube from the inside. But no matter what combination of tolerances I had, it just didn't work. They were never as strong as just having an interference fit. So now all of these carbon fiber tubes are just basically hammered into the plastic parts, which means that it's going to be basically impossible to get them out without breaking the plastic parts, but hopefully I shouldn't need to. This does mean that those tubes are solidly fixed into the printed parts, which massively helps with the stiffness of this whole design. The reason why I chose carbon fiber for these tubes is to minimize on weight, because anytime you have a part that's moving around, you really want to try to cut down on weight so that you need as little force as possible to move that part. Not to mention the fact that carbon fiber looks pretty sexy in my opinion. So these three carbon fiber tubes form the main sort of structure of the linear actuator, but the thing that actually causes the linear motion is this fourth carbon fiber tube in the middle that actually extends and contracts. To make sure that fourth tube can only move perfectly straight up and down, I have these six bearings and they perfectly constrain the motion so that it can only be straight up and down. Now this does present some issues with 3D printing tolerance because this main red part here is all one piece. And for whatever reason, when I printed this off, it was not exactly perfect. And having the bearings positioned where they're supposed to be had a little bit of wobble. And that's not okay. This tube needs to be perfectly straight in and out. So what I did is I adjusted these spaces that are black here and made different versions of them that have different concentricity. So that if there's too much space and the tube can wobble, I can choose one of the other versions of the spaces and then that will move the bearing a little bit closer to the tube. And the fact that these are 0 0.1, 0 0.2 and 0 0.3 millimeters may not seem like much, but that makes all the difference as far as these tolerances are concerned. Swapping one set of these spaces to the white version completely removed all of the wobble of the tube. Something that I really like about this design is that it's cable actuated, or in my case, string actuated. And this is really handy because it means that you can put the motor that's actually driving this motion far away from the actuator itself. Depending on the application for these actuators, you may need to know exactly how long the actuator is at all times. And so for those cases, there's the option of adding in a magnetic encoder to directly measure the exact length of the leg. This attaches at the bottom of the leg and the constant force spring that's shown wrapped around this black drum goes up and attaches to the bottom of the extending part of the leg. So this way, as the leg extends, the constant force spring unwinds and you can measure the twist of that drum 
using the magnetic encoder that's on that chip there. I'm not planning on using these magnetic encoders for Juggerbot right now. I just have them here as sort of like a carry on from a previous design. And the reason why I don't need them is because I have encoders on the motors themselves. So I'm measuring the exact position of the motor as it spins around. And I'm just assuming that there's no backlash in the system. So therefore the movement of the motor directly corresponds to the movement of the leg. That will cause problems if there becomes any slack in the system and backlash. But so far in all my testing, that hasn't happened. So fingers crossed that it stays that way. The next major change that I've made between this design and the previous design is that I'm now using O-Drive motor drivers. And these drivers are amazing in what they can sense and what they can do. One thing in particular that I am absolutely in love with is that they can sense the current going through the motor. And what this allows me to do is completely remove the need for limit switches. In all of my earlier designs, I either had a limit switch or some convoluted way to measure where the end of the travel was. That was kind of annoying, but with these O-drives, I can basically compress the linear actuator as far as it can possibly go. And when it hits the limit, the current through the motor spikes, the O-drive detects that spike, and then it knows that it's at the end. This is so much easier and quicker and smoother than the way that I was doing it before, and I love it. It's great. Now that we understand how the linear actuator works, let's see how to put it together. The first step is to get this string pulley and put it inside the bearing block. It's a lot easier to do this now when there's nothing else attached to the bearing block, so I suggest doing this first. I'm using M5 bushings between the pulley and the rod that it's riding on. This just reduces the friction a little bit and means that the pulley can't really move off of the rod as easily. This probably isn't critical, and honestly, I think just having the pulley straight on the rod would be totally fine. It can be a little bit fiddly to attach it with the rod, especially if the tolerances for the rod are not quite right. In my case, I had to give it a bit of a persuasion to get it in, but it shouldn't be too tricky. I put washers on either side of this pulley just to make sure that it runs a little bit more smoothly. You probably don't need them, but I like to include them. These are quite fiddly to get in place, so it's up to you whether you include them or not. Once the pulley is in and the rod that it's attached to is pushed in all the way, the pulley should spin completely freely. Once the pulley is in, the next step is to fit the bearings. I suggest starting with the fully concentric spaces just to see if those work. If there's any wobble at all, then just take out one set of the spaces, so either the ones on the top or on the bottom, and replace them with the next sized concentricity. At this point, I suggest not screwing in the spaces because it can be a little bit fiddly to do that. Just place them in and then test out to see if the rod has any wobble. If it does, then swap them out for a different size. Once you've found what size spaces you need, you can screw in the bottom set of spaces. I suggest not screwing in the top half and actually taking them out right now because the next step involves a lot of hammering and it's probably not great for the bearings to be hammered on so much. I forgot to do this when I started, but it's a very good idea to measure out exactly how far you need the carbon fiber tubes to be in the pieces before you start hammering them. Otherwise you've got no idea if they're in the whole way or not. It is very important that the carbon fiber tubes are in the entire way, otherwise the whole thing is going to be sort of skewed. So what I suggest doing is marking out with masking tape exactly the correct lengths. These lengths are 30 millimeters for the upper bearing block part and 12 millimeters for the other end. Once you've marked these out, then you can go hammering away until you hit the end of the masking tape. And then you'll know that the carbon fiber tube is in the entire way. Once all the tubes are attached to the bearing block, the next step is to attach the other end. And this essentially just involves lining it up and hammering it in. It is worth being aware of which direction you have this attached to though. The way that I've designed this is to have the magnetic encoder part on the same side as the empty part of the bearing block. And then if you flip it over, the two sort of wings of the bearing block will be on the same side as the empty side of the other end. The only reason why this matters is because it lines up the holes for the lower end of the inner tube of the actuator. If you're not planning on using the magnetic encoder, then it really doesn't matter which way this piece is oriented. And same as before, just hammer it in until it's in the whole way. Now you can go ahead and attach the bearings back on where we took them out before. And it's a very good idea now to just double check that everything is lining up properly. If everything is correct, then the inner tube should be perfectly centered in the end piece of the actuator. If anything is off by a little bit, you may need to hammer one end of the actuator a little bit more than the others to sort of straighten things up a bit. In my case, this is looking pretty centered, so I'm happy with that. Now that we know that everything is correct, we can fully bolt in the bearings at the top of the actuator. The next step is to attach the lower end piece of the main rod. I suggest screwing in the bolt a little bit here before you place it in, just because it's a little bit fiddly to do it once it's already in place. So just screw this in a couple of turns just to like hold it in place. Then it should just be a matter of press fitting that piece onto the end of the rod. It's a good idea now to line everything up so that the hole for the string for this piece is in line with where the string will be coming down from the pulley, because when we put the next piece on, everything sort of has to be lined up correctly, otherwise the strings are gonna get twisted around. 
And the next piece is the top part of the main rod. Same as before, I suggest screwing in the bolt just a couple of turns to hold it in place. And then for my application, I need a magnet in the end of the linear actuator. So I'm gonna place that in now with just a couple dabs of super glue to make sure it doesn't go anywhere. And now this piece is ready to attach onto the end of the tube. It's worth making sure here that the holes are lined up so that the string doesn't get twisted around when the actuator is in motion. We're almost done with the actuator now, and the next step is to cut the PTFE tubes that are going to guide the string. So just measure them out and cut them to the lengths that you need, in my case 55 and 60 centimeters. And it's a pretty good idea to chamfer the end of one of these tubes just to make it a little bit easier to push into one of the spots. I've heard that this can be done fairly easily with a pencil sharpener, but I don't have any pencil sharpeners, so I'm just doing it with a box cutter and that worked relatively well. Now we take that chamfered end of the PTFE tube and press it into the sort of tunnel part of the bearing block. This is the, the slot that has like a longer hole in it. And you should be able to push it through until you can see it at the very end. It's a little bit hard to show this on camera, but hopefully you can see it there. Now we can do the same thing on the other side where the pulley is, just attach the PTFE connector and press in the tube. Again, you should be able to see it on the other side of the hole. Now as for the line that's driving this motion, I'm using this Kevlar line that's used for kites and this seems to be working pretty well for me so far. So just cut out two lengths that are longer than you need them to be because it's very annoying to have to refit them again. I think I cut my lengths to like a bit over a meter. It is extremely helpful to have a thin wire on hand with a little hook bent into the end. It would be significantly more difficult to route the string through this mechanism without this wire. It doesn't matter which string you route first, I'm starting with the one that wraps around the pulley. And as it happens, I didn't actually need the routing wire for this step. I could just press it through and then collect it at the end with my pliers. It is extremely important here to make sure that when you route the string, it goes around the pulley, not up and over it. This might seem super obvious, but one time when I broke one of the strings and I rerouted it, I forgot to do this, and I was very surprised by what happened. And realized that I didn't put the string around the pulley. And it was just cutting into the filament. How nuts is that? It's fully cut into it. Once the string has been wrapped over the pulley, you need to pull it back down through the bearing block and then finally through the hole at the end piece where it's wrapped around that bolt one or two times and then you can do the bolt up nice and tight and it will completely clamp the string so it can't pull out. It's a good idea to test it at this point and make sure that if you pull the string, then the leg should extend. And now we can route the second string. This one I have found is pretty much impossible to do without this routing wire and I suggest feeding it through from the end first and then back to the start. You can then form a little loop in the string and then pull the string back through with the wire. When I was doing this, the string actually slipped off the end of the wire at the very end, but thankfully there was just enough through for me to grab it with the pliers. And then in the same way as the other piece, you just need to get the string through the little hole at the end piece, wrap it around the bolt one or two times, do the bolt up, and then you're good to go. And that's it, the actuator is done. It's a good idea to test everything before you hook it up to a motor. So just pull each string in turn and make sure that one of them compresses the actuator and the other one extends it. And if everything's been done correctly, then they should pull through with relatively low resistance. Now that we've built the linear actuator, let's see what it can do. The first test that I find the most interesting is a speed test. What I did for this is I got the leg to extend completely and then contract completely and do that a couple of times at one speed. And then after it's gone through a couple cycles, increase the speed a little bit. And then I'll know what speed it can handle by something failing. The results from this test I find to be super promising because it can cover its full stroke length, which is just over 260 millimeters in one tenth of a second giving the leg an average speed of 2.6 meters per second. This is so much faster than the previous designs that I had, and I am just blown away by these results. The next test that I did was to see what sort of endurance it's got. And what I did for this is I ran it for 2000 cycles at a pretty decent speed, and I saw no issues at all. It was just going happy as Larry with no issues. Maybe something would come up after like 10,000 or 20,000 cycles, but nothing really happened after 2000, which as far as I'm concerned is pretty good. Now, despite all of these pros, there are two possible issues that I can see with this design. One is that one of the strings is clamped between one of the pulleys and the main carbon fiber tube. This doesn't seem to be causing issues, but I don't really like that it's doing that. However, it's not really that easy to fix. Space is at a premium in that region of the linear actuator, and I can't see an easy way to get rid of this issue. I'm gonna keep monitoring this spot on the linear actuator, and if anything comes up, then I'll have to redesign where that string gets routed, but for now, it seems to be okay. The second possible issue is that these PTFE tubes that I've got can buckle a little bit. 
I don't think that these tubes are designed for this sort of application. And if there's a high enough force going through the string, then these tubes can collapse a little bit, which shrinks the length of the string's path and means that the string will be a little bit loose. And if the string is loose, then there's backlash in the system. And then I won't know exactly how long the linear actuator is at any given time. So that's really not ideal. Thankfully, this only seems to be happening when something goes wrong and the motor just like jams the leg too long or too short. So as long as I avoid that, it seems to be okay, but it may be an issue in the future as I run it through like hundreds of thousands of cycles. The solution for this, I think, is just to get a proper cable transmission system. I don't really know that much about cable transmission systems, so I don't know what would be best in terms of great flexibility of the string or cable, as well as flexibility of the tube. I don't know. If you've got any ideas, then I would love to know. This, yeah, this might be an issue later and I would be happy to resolve it now rather than later. However, if there's no easy solution, then I think that these PTFE tubes should work totally fine. And that's it. These linear actuators are so much better than the ones that I've made previously. I am so, so, so happy with how they've turned out. They're super, super stiff. They're quite light. This like bearing block thing at the end is a little bit heavy, but for my purposes, it shouldn't be moving around too much. So I don't think that's too big of an issue, but just the overall speed and stiffness of everything is just phenomenal. I cannot wait to have all six of these put together and see Juggerbot moving around. It's, it's gonna be pretty impressive, I think. As always, I hope you found this interesting. And if you have any thoughts at all, then please let me know in the comments below. And until the next one, have a good one.